Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. Yo, it's your boy, the odd guy himself, Malik King Scott. Hi, I'm Charlie Edwards. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosmo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 31 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as always, by Ayaz Sumra. Ayaz, how are you doing? I'm good, Joey. How are you? Very good, very good. Now, of course, this week we've got a lot to talk about, a lot to review, a lot to preview. A lot of fights took place last weekend and a lot of big fights are taking place this weekend. So there's a lot to talk about in this week's show. We're going to be talking in depth about a lot of fights. So we're going to waste no time. We're going to get, of course, straight into part one, part one, the review part. We're going to start with a fight that took place over in Atlantic City. Top of the bill, Anthony Durrell. He faced Caleb Truax. Now, Anthony Durrell, 28 and 1 with the one draw going into this fight. He picked up a TKO in round one. So he now moves to 29 and 1 with the one draw. A good win for Anthony Durrell. And his brother, of course, was also on that bill, Andre Durrell. He moved to 25 and 2 with a unanimous decision after 10 rounds over Blake Caparello. Now, Andre Durrell was actually down in round two, but of course, he got up off the canvas and managed to cruise to a unanimous decision. So, Blake Caparello now 22 and 2. It was a good fight, this fight. It really was a good fight. So, we're now going to go over to the little prospect who was also on the bill, a prospect that I mentioned from last week, Jonathan Guzman, 20 and 0 with 20 stoppages going into this fight. He put his opponent down in round five and round eight. And his opponent, Daniel Rosas, decided to not come out for the ninth round and he retired on his stall at the end of round at the end of round eight. So Jonathan Guzman now 21 and 0 with 21 stoppages. Again, this is a name that we'll be hearing very, very soon. You know, that we know him here on the Box Hard podcast, but I'm telling you, he's going to become a household name in the near future. But that's really it for Friday. Not, nothing else really happened on the Friday. We're now going to go over to Saturday. We're going to start over in Wigan. The return of the kid kid galahad he got out and he picked up his 19th professional win the opponent that he faced was let's not mince our words he was a journeyman he had a record of six wins and 45 losses it's just because kid galahad hasn't fought for around about 18 19 months due to the ban he was on so he's back from the ban and he was back with a bang with a TKO win in the fourth round. It was only scheduled for six, but he picked up the win. Interestingly, he was actually at lightweight for this fight. It wasn't at Super Bantam. So interesting stuff that I think hopefully he'll lose a couple of pounds and go back down to Super Bantam. But nonetheless, you know, exciting for Kid Galahad to return back to the sport. We've missed him. We've missed him a lot, to be totally honest, in British boxing. We're now going to go over to the copper box. Huey Fury, he faced Fred Cassie. Now, this was a strange old fight. Huey Fury didn't really seem like his usual self. He wasn't really as aggressive or as active as he usually is. Um, Fred Cassie come to make it ugly. He come to, you know, be very awkward, which we knew that he was. It was always going to be a tough fight. Fury was cut above the left eye in an accidental head clash early on in the fight. The cut deteriorated and it had to be drawn to a halt. But um, because it was an accidental head clash and it wasn't a punch, if it was a punch, it would have been stopped. If the cut got really, really bad, the doctor would have stopped it and Fred Cassie would have got the win. But because it was an accidental head clash that caused the cut... It had to be stopped and it had to go down to the judges' scorecards. It was what's called a technical decision. It was stopped in the seventh round and Fury ended up picking up the win because he was leading on the judges' scorecards. So he ended up winning that fight via technical decision. It was for the vacant WBO Intercontinental Heavyweight title. So Fury's now picked up that belt. And also, Huey Fury, this is a belt that his cousin Tyson Fury picked up on his way to the top. So this is a good belt for Huey Fury, and this will put him in a good ranking with the WBO, 
which of course Tyson holds that belt. But we don't know what's going to happen because of course this week we got Klitsch, we got Tyson Fury saying he's going to retire. I don't know whether to believe that or not. To be totally honest, I'm not going to buy that for one second. Anyways, moving down that bill, Ryan Walsh, he defended his British featherweight title against James Tennyson. It was a successful defense. Ryan Walsh moves to 21 and 1 with the one draw. Tennyson was down in the second round and again in the fifth. Both of these knockdowns from body shots. So Ryan Walsh showing some smarts there and nonetheless picks up another win. So good for him. Also on this bill, moving down the card, undefeated Anthony Nelson, 11 and 0, faced undefeated Jamie Conlon, 15 and 0. Now, everybody thought this was going to be a good fight. I did say it last week. Anthony Nelson, of course, was the Commonwealth super flyweight champion. This was unbelievable, this fight. This was absolutely unbelievable. You've got to watch it if you haven't seen it. This is definitely a contender for fight of the year. I don't even think we need to see any more fights. We're only in April. Well, we're now in May. This fight, of course, took place on the 30th of April on the Saturday. I don't think we need to see any more fights this year. I think we can already stamp it as the fight of the year. It was absolutely filled with entertainment. If you, Like I say, if you haven't watched it, you've got to watch it. Oh, my Lord. Conlon was cut by by his left eye in the first round. He was down in the third round. And Anthony Nelson was down in the first round and again in the fifth. And finally, he was down with a left and it was in a, it was a body shot. It absolutely crumbled Anthony Nelson. That was in the eighth round. So Jamie Conlon, who I think started absolutely brilliant, and then he was knocked down. And then next thing you know, and, and he, he got the cut, and then he was winning a little bit, and he looked like he was going to stop Anthony Nelson. And then Nelson, you know, he gritted his teeth, bit down on that gum shield, and he just he just went for it. And he ended up bossing the fight for a few rounds. And then there was another turn in the towel. So it was really, you know, it was it, it was such a good fight. It was it was a brilliant fight. I don't know if you caught that one, I has, but it was. If you haven't seen it, you've got to watch that fight. Did you catch it at all? No, I haven't got the chance to watch it, but I'm going to be watching it tonight, actually, because I've recorded it on um, Sky Plus. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you've got to watch it because this fight was, oh, wow. It was just filled with excitement. Like I say, what a fight. It was like Britain's very own um, Britain's very own Wald and Gatti. That was the type of fight that it was. It was, it was absolutely unreal. So... You know, Anthony Nelson, he's now got the one blemish on his record. He's record now 11 and 1. And Jamie Conlon, the new Commonwealth Super Flyweight Champion, 16 and 0. What a fight. Like I say, Conlon picked up the victory. TKO round 8 was the outcome. Liam Walsh was also on the bill. He moved to 20 and 0 with a TKO in the 8th round. He, of course, defended his British Super Featherweight title against Troy James. Louis Petit was also on the bill. He moved to 19 and two with a TKO in the second round. Joe Pigford moved to 10 and 0 with a TKO in the first round. Vijenda Singh, he moved to 5 and 0 with a TKO in the fifth round. It's five knockouts on the spin for Vijenda Singh now. Anthony Yard moved to 6 and 0 with a KO in the second round. Again, Anthony Yard looked absolutely sensational. It was kind of hard to watch that fight. He was absolutely battering his opponent. Boy Jones Jr. moved to 8 and 0. Of course, he's got that one draw. He picked up a TKO in the fourth round. A lot of knockouts on this card, to be totally honest with you. A lot of knockouts on this card. Tony Banj also made his debut on this card. Tony Banj is someone that is being guided by Prince Nassim Hamed. Tony Banj picked up a points win. He was only a four-rounder, of course, on his debut, so he picked up a points win. So a good win for Tony Banj, and hopefully we'll see him mix it up in the near future. I know that he's got a good man behind him in Prince Nassim Hamed, so it'll be interesting to see how he develops that's it for the UK we're now going to go over to Carson California this is a bill that had a lot of good fights on it we're going to start with the heavyweight fight between our good friend Eddie Chambers and Gerald Washington Gerald Washington this was a fight that we both stayed up for I as I know it was really late in the evening or really early hours of Sunday should I say um Gerald Washington to be honest he didn't he didn't look fantastic in there Eddie Chambers just was not throwing enough punches you know there was little bursts from Eddie Chambers where he was sort of showing how fast he can be, but he just wasn't active enough. He was sitting there waiting to counter Gerald Washington. Gerald Washington was keeping it long. When they were up close, Eddie Chambers had a little bit of success, but he just did not throw enough punches. I think they said something like in the first three rounds, he'd only landed 12 punches, whereas Gerald Washington 
much, you know, he'd landed much more punches. So he had a bad start to the fight, Eddie Chambers. He had a decent finish. I think maybe he was waiting for Gerald Washington to tire. I'm not sure. It was only an eight rounder, so it wasn't a good tactic. But Gerald Washington was actually tiring, but he was still doing enough. I was really disappointed with Eddie Chambers, to be totally honest. Um, you know, like I say, he's he's one of my favourite. He is the favourite. He's my favourite person in boxing. But I have to say, he was he was very unimpressive. And I think maybe that'll be his. You know, it might be his time to hang him up. Of course, we had him on the show last week, and he was saying what he would be doing if he lost the fight. So it might be the end for Eddie Chambers. But if it is, then it's it's very sad for us, and um, we wish him all the best, of course. But Gerald Washington, he remains undefeated. His record now 17-0 and 0 with the one draw. And he picked up the unanimous decision after eight rounds. I want to see him in there with someone who's, you know, someone who's going to really be on him. I think he wouldn't last too long with someone like David Hay or something like that. But I don't think David Hay would be fancy in that fight in the near future. Also on the build, David Benavidez. He moved to 14-0 and 0 with a KO in the second round. Jorge Lara was also on the bill. He faced former world champion, former Lee Selby foe, Fernando Montiel. Fernando Montiel gave Selby a really tough fight. Well, Jorge Lara wiped him out in the first round via KO. Montiel was down four times in the first round. So Jorge Lara really, you know, he's going to blast on the scene now. He's record 28 and 0 with two draws. And I'm telling you, after seeing that destruction, he really is going to be, you know, he's going to be on that world scene very, very soon. If he done that to to Fernando Montiel, you know, he absolutely smashed um, Montiel, and Selby couldn't do anything like that to Montiel. I know that Styles make fights, and Selby was going over there to America. I don't think he went over there with too much too much time to get adjusted into the time zone and stuff. I think he underestimated Montiel. It wasn't a shining performance, but we'll have to see what Jorge Lara can do on that world stage. Also on the bill, Thomas Williams Jr. He moved to 20 and one with a win over Edwin Rodriguez. Now I thought Edwin Rodriguez would probably win this fight. He had a record of 28 and one and his one loss was coming to Andre Ward, you know, arguably the best fighter in the world. So Thomas Williams Jr. Ended up picking up a KO in round two. So a bit of a shock to me, a bit of a shock to me, but that'd be interesting. Again, a lot of fighters on this bill, since they've won, I'm going to be paying my attention on them. I'm going to be giving them a lot of attention. So it'd be interesting to see where these fighters move from from here. And now we're going to go over to the main event, Andre Berto against Victor Ortiz. Firstly, I, as I'm going to throw it over to you, what did you think about this? Of course, Ortiz... He had a cut head from an accidental headbutt in round one. Berto was down in round two. Ortiz was down in round four, and it ended in round four. Berto picked up the KO in round four. What did you think about this fight, Ayaz? Uh, give credit to Berto for winning the fight. But a lot of people are saying Ortiz gave up. Now, I'm not quite sure if he actually got beaten up or what, but Ortiz got the loss. Now, is his mindset is actually in boxing or not? No one really knows, is it? Yeah, I, I honestly think that it's time for him to give it up. When he was actually leaving the ring, someone threw a pizza at him. You know, people were disgusted. He actually got on the mic in the ring and had the audacity to say that, you know, it was a good fight. I'm sure that the fans got their money's worth. It was almost like he was being sarcastic. It was absolutely awful from Victor Ortiz. He landed a good shot on Andre Berto that put Berto down. But I will say that when Berto knocked Ortiz down, he, he didn't want to carry on. The referee said to him, do you want to carry on? And he blanked him. Now, I know there was nothing wrong with his voice. I know he could have said something, whether it be yes or no or whatever. He didn't answer the referee. The referee asked him once or twice. He didn't answer the referee. So in my opinion, he quit. You know, And a lot of people were saying that. A lot of people were not happy with him. It's strange. I don't understand Victor Ortiz, you know. He's obviously got some bottle because he can, you know, he puts himself through training, puts himself through sparring, the whole training camp, comes to fight. When he does get in the ring, he actually does go for it. But as soon as he gets knocked down, it's like, right, yeah, I've had enough of this now. I just, we, this is not the first time we've seen it. We've seen it in there when he fought Maidana, which was a good fight. And he put Maidana down a few times as well. I just, I don't really understand what goes through his head. It's like he gets knocked down and thinks, whoa. You know, I'm not having that happen again, so I'd rather just walk out. I, I don't understand it. I really don't understand it. He was all for against Louis Colazzo. I believe he got knocked out in the second round. Again, it was the same sort of thing. He just didn't want to know. So very, 
unimpressive from Victor Ortiz. It was so unimpressive that I'm not too impressed with Andre Berto, to be honest. It wasn't a great win. So Andre Berto, no doubt he'll now get another shot at one of the big boys in the welterweight division, but he will probably get blasted out because I don't think he's any good. Andre Berto, 31 wins and four losses now. Victor Ortiz, 31 wins, six losses and two draws. And I really hope he retires now because he's just a name. All he is, his prospects are going to come up and get a nice win over him because he's a former world champ and that'll be it. Um, that's it now for Carson, California. We're now going to go over to the Armory in Washington. Top of the bill, Badu Jack. He faced Lucian Butte. Badu Jack, 20 wins, one loss and one draw. Lucian Butte, 32 and three. This was for Jack's WBC World Super Middleweight title. Lucian Butte, he was impressive during some of the fight, but I think that Badu Jack won it, in my opinion, pretty comfortably. Maybe two or three rounds. But it ended up being a majority draw. One judge gave it to Badu Jack and two judges gave it a draw. So it was it was declared a draw. Um, Mayweather got in the ring, Floyd Mayweather afterwards, and he was saying how disgusted he was with the judges. It was a bit of a, a bit of a joke. Badu Jack said that he believes there's some sort of conspiracy against the money team. I don't think that's the case. But Badu Jack, he's he's been involved in a few close decisions where it's where to be honest, he's won it by a landslide. But Badu Jack, nonetheless, this is a bit of a you know, a bit of a halt, to be totally honest, in his career. This is his second draw now. His record now, 20 wins, one loss, and two draws. So, Badu Jack, again, we know what happened, but on paper, it's another draw. So, Badu Jack, I'm sure, you know, he won't be too happy. And I know that he's just recently brought a daughter into the world. I know that he's, his, his woman just gave birth to a baby daughter just a couple of days before the fight. So, I'm sure, you know, the good with the bad, really, for him. But... I think that Badu Jack, it, it wasn't it wasn't very fair what went on. And James DeGale was also on the bill. He got in the ring afterwards and they were interviewing really the three of them, James DeGale, Lucian Butte and Badu Jack. Now, Lucian Butte was asked, did you think that you won the fight or did you think it was a draw? And he didn't really want to say no. You know, I can't, I think it was a bit of a silly question to be totally honest from Jim Gray. Um, he's not going to sit there and go, no, I thought I lost what the judge is doing. You know, he, he had to say, look, you know, the rounds were close. I think he dealt with that question quite professionally. They asked him who's the best out of Badu Jack and James DeGale. He didn't really want to answer that question. We're yet to see. I really hope that fight does take place. But also on the bill, James DeGal, he defended successfully his IBF World Super Middleweight title against Rogelio Medina. James DeGal now 23 and 1. This was a closer fight than it had to be. James DeGal seemed to do his usual, to be totally honest. He gets in there, he decides that he's going to win a few of the early rounds pretty easily. Then for some reason, he takes his foot off the gas like we've seen so many times with James DeGale. And he cruises for a few rounds and he ends up losing a few rounds and he gets the fight ends up getting close again. And then he has to come on in the last few rounds just to just to basically confirm he's going to get the win. Strange tactics from James DeGale. I really don't understand why he does this. And this could be his downfall against someone like Callum Smith. Because if you let Callum Smith win a few rounds, if they were to fight, I think that, James DeGale could end up being dethroned if he does that. So I don't really know why James DeGale does this, but nonetheless, he picked up another win. It was unanimous after 12 rounds. But again, like I say, it was a lot closer than James DeGale could have made it. He was on the ropes. He was like riding Medina's shots and he looked very beat up and bruised after the fight. A lot worse off than Medina. But as James DeGale said, you know, he bruises very easily. and He's just got that skin. Every fight, he looks pretty bad after the fight regardless of how many punches he's taken or whatever. But that's really it for the whole of the review side of the show. We spent a little bit of time talking about that and reviewing it for you. We're now going to welcome our first guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kid Galahad. Kid, welcome back to the show. I'm happy to be back. How are you? Very good, very good. Last time we spoke, you said we'd be ringing you back real soon. You said it, and we here we are ringing you back. Yeah, it's, it hasn't been very long. I think it's been... About four weeks, has it? About four to five weeks. Something like that. Now, last time you was on, yeah, of course, you said that you'd be, you, that you'd have some news. That turned out that the the board lifted the ban. They cut six months six months off of the ban. Now you returned on the weekend. You were nineteen months out of the ring. You just returned and moved to nineteen and yeah. zero with a fourth round KO. How does it feel yeah. to be back, kid? 
it felt good. It felt like being back at home inside that ring, you know. The kid wasn't the best. We only had a week's notice. But I went in there and did what I could do against that kind of a level of opponent. And went in there and this man told him and got him out there quick to get onto bigger and better fights. I know that obviously you've only just returned for the one fight, but is there anyone you've got your eye on at the yeah. minute? I know that it's, it's pretty early. Anybody, to be honest with you, anybody who's got the big, the big world titles, I'll fight anybody. I'm willing to fight anybody. I have a super one, super bantamweight division. I personally, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the best super bantamweights in the world. So, um, what sort of time scale would you leave here? Obviously, like I say, you've only just come back. How long do you want before you face one of the guys at the yeah. top of the division? Listen, I'm, if they can, if they can, obviously you need to get in the position to fight for the world title. But if they can get him in the position within two fights, I'd happily take it. You know. I believe I could be any world champion out there at this moment in time. I believe me and Rubondo are probably the leading two. But yeah. obviously, our level of form in that box on the weekend, he, he, that's what you've got to do to them kind of kids. You can't be going the distance with them kind of kids or struggling. You've got to be taking them kind of kids out and taking them out in style. Now, listen, last time we were on the phone, um, we were talking for about an hour yeah. off air. We literally couldn't get off the phone to each other. Yeah. Talking boxing with you is interesting because you know so much about all different types of weights and the fighters. There's a few fights I want to ask you about that yeah. are coming up in the near future. Yeah, well. Okay, so this weekend, obviously, we've got Anthony Crawler defending his title against Barroso. What do you think about that fight? Do you know what? A lot of people are knocking Anthony Crawler, but for some reason, I, I believe if he doesn't get caught within. It's a hard one to just. I, I, I think he can do it. I think he can beat this kid because I don't really think this kid has boxed anyone the level that Corolla's boxed. Corolla's boxed at a high level for a long time, hasn't he? And he's boxed all good kids as well. Bros, the only person who Bros has actually boxed who was decent is his last opponent. That was that kid from London, uh, Kevin Mitchell. But Kevin Mitchell, being obviously, to me, just didn't see him uh, as hungry, as motivated in that fight. Is when he boxed Lunares, that Lunares fight, to me, it looked like he took everything out of him. Do you know what I mean? I think if he, if he had to box Barroso, if Kevin Mitchell had to box that Barroso, when he boxed Lunares, he would have beat Bar- Barroso that night. And I just believe that Lunares fight took everything out of him. And he was probably just declining a bit and Barroso coming at the right time and did the job on him. Anthony College young, he's hungry, he can fight. And I believe if it goes past six, I think Corolla will be him if it goes past six though absolutely we hope so um, also I want to I want to get your views on Frampton moving up to face Santa Cruz yeah it's, it's, it's a good fight for him but I think it depends on it's like you got people forget that your Santa Cruz is actually a bantamweight and he's moved up to featherweight hasn't he so I don't I think inside the ring there won't be that much of a difference but um, I believe uh, Leo Sanskrit's boxing ability is, is going to beat Frampton that night. I think Leo Sanskrit is better than Leo Sanskrit is better than Frampton in every single department. I can't see him beating him anyway, unless he knocks him out. But I can't see him outboxing him, outdoing him in any, anything. And uh, I think Leo Sanskrit's a great stoppage. I hope you're wrong on that one because, uh, you know, I, I like Frampton. I like you a bit better, but I like Frampton. <laughs> no, it, I just, I just for some reason, I don't know, in his last two fights, to me, there's signs of, of uh, he's going downhill. I don't know. It, it might be it's the weight issue, whatever it is, or he's, he's, he's having too many hard spars or whatever it is. But obviously, something, something when, he boxed, when he boxed Scott Quigg, he seemed to gas after eight. If he's been doing 15 rounds in the gym every, every other day or whatever it is, shouldn't be gassing after 50. You shouldn't be gassing after eight rounds, should you? Yeah, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Now, this one, this fight, I'm going to I'm gonna throw at you. It's a bit of a strange one. It's, it's, it's one that I've put in, yeah. you know, in the questions purely just to sort of, to make you think, really. It's a bit of a tough one. It's nowhere near your weight class. What do you think about George Groves yeah. fighting Martin Murray? That's a tough fight. That's a tough fight. But you know what? <clears throat> I'm a I'm a big fan of George Groves. I like George Groves. I think he's uh, especially when he's, he's moved to this this new trainer. To me, he seems like he's got a bit better. But he's he's good. He's he can punch. He can he can do everything. George Groves. I just think the times he's been beat by Carl Frotch, it just wasn't his time at that moment. It, it wasn't. I think he was just wasn't ready at that time. Do you know what I mean? And they put him in them hard fights against. 
someone like Carl Frotch. Carl Frotch is like, fucking hell, he's a machine, isn't he? And I just think they're bad timing in them fights for him. I don't know, I can't see Martin Murray beating them. Honestly, I can't see Martin Murray beating them. Groves in, in anything. I think Groves is, is a very well-rounded fire, me. I think he's, he's good at everything. I can't really see him beating him. I think he, I think he, he'll just keep Martin Murray on the end of his jab and just beat him up. I'm, I'm probably might even stop him late. How do you see it going? How do I see it going? I, going? Um, I reckon it is yeah. such a tough fight because, like I say, both guys have fought for a world title and fallen short. Um, some of them, yeah, in, in some it, cases, but, but, go on. But, yeah, but I know everyone's putting it with the Golovkin and, and whatever, but you got to remember Martin Murray's in middleweight. George Groves is a big super band, super middleweight. Yeah, yeah, that's the point there. Um, how do I see it going? Do you know what? He, yeah, I think you'd have to side with Groves, really, wouldn't you? You know, Martin Murray, he's a good fighter, though, and it's definitely not going to be not going to be uh, going to be easy for George. And I think that Martin Murray's tough enough to stay around those late rounds, and George gasses a little bit as well. So we'll have to see. He does, but I'm, I'm not saying. But to, for me, when he boxed when he boxed uh, Golovkin. To me, he didn't seem to have gone in there to win the fight. He went in there to survive. When people box Golovkin, Golovkin, they don't go in to win. They go in there to survive, to see if they can last 12 rounds to claim that they've, they've gone 12 rounds with Golovkin, if you know what I mean. But this fight, if he comes and tries to have a... If he comes to fight and win this fight against Groves, and Groves can punch, I think he'll walk onto something. And he could actually get the stop... Groves could actually stop him. This is a different fight than the Golovkin fight. Because he'll believe he can win this fight, so he's gonna go at it. I, I don't believe believe he, he could. He thought he could beat Golovkin, so he just go out to fight for twelve rounds or whatever it was. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you're saying. Well, we'll have to wait and see, but yeah, nonetheless, it'll be a good fight. Now, I just want to let you know this: the other day. It was literally, it's gone on for about three days now. I've been arguing back and forth with this other yeah. boxing guy on uh, on Twitter. So he basically made an outrageous yeah. statement, in my opinion. He said that Joshua yeah. would knock Fury out in three rounds. Well, obviously, he must not know nothing about boxing then. Well, that's funny because he said to me that I know nothing about boxing. Well, either, obviously, he must not know nothing about boxing if he thinks that. It's because like I level said... Opponents, Joshua is boxing the level opponent. Tyson you know, boxes too. It's like, yeah, yeah. But people, a lot of people, everyone's got their own opinions, haven't they? And people, they, they just see the way Sky built him up and they think like, he's, obviously, he's Anthony Joshua, no, you can't dislike Anthony Joshua. No one can dislike him. He's going there, he's doing what he's doing. He's a nice kid. He's, he's knocking everyone out. He's doing what he's doing and he's doing it in style. But Tyson Fury, man, Tyson, at this moment in time, I don't think he'd beat Tyson Fury, no. But I think people people get muddled up with like like Sky and and like saying people how they pick up Anthony Joshua. Like I, I think someone's saying something about he's on the same level as Lennox Lewis or something. Like that. And I just thought, how can he be on the same level level as Lennox Lewis? Lennox Lewis is the best fight we've fucking ever produced. Well, I tell you this, I'm not sure you know, if you saw it the other day. Kid, let me tell you this. Yeah. This is this is really shocking. Someone the other day, you know, like on on Twitter, you got a lot of guys who like to draw paintings of boxers and stuff. Yeah. Someone drew a painting the other day of Muhammad Ali on the left, Mike Tyson on the right, yeah. and and Joshua in the middle. And but that's what I mean. But Joshua, Joshua's he's a superstar in his own right, and he's 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 like um he's they're trying to build up like a Mike Tyson kind of thing. He's our Mike Tyson. There's not many good heavyweights out there. Ooh, we've, got, we've, got, we've, we've got the best heavyweights. We've got David Day. We've got Tyson, number one, Tyson Fury. Then we've got Anthony Joshua. We've got David Day. We've got Dylan White. And we've got, we've got, we've got some good heavyweights. I mean, like... But that's what I mean. People... It's the way it's, I'm going to tell you something. The way this guy is building up Anthony Joshua, you could not build anyone up better than that. They're, they're doing a good job on them. Yeah, they, they are. are they've done a, like they've done a tremendous point. job. Like I say, you know, he's been match well. Well, he's knocked that, everybody out. But, but we have to remember that Fury, yeah. <laughs> Fury, Fury's two wins over Klitschko and Cunningham, both those opponents are better than anyone that Joshua shared a ring with. Just remember this. Remember back in the day, when Frank Bruno was around, Mike Tyson, Lennox Lewis. Who was the biggest one after Mike Tyson? Who was the biggest, who was the biggest heavyweight we've had? Was Frank Bruno? Is that true or not? Yeah, in England, yeah, you'd have in to England, say, yeah. In England, in England, Bruno was huge, weren't he? Everyone loved him. Yeah, Just yeah, like yeah. Anthony Joshua, is that true or not? And Lennox Lewis, they always fucking, they, they always like try to single him out, didn't they? 
Well, then when they boxed Mike Tyson, and then we all claimed him. But other than that, they always Bruno, Bruno, Bruno. Lennox Lewis wasn't the main one. It was always Bruno, weren't it? And they built him up for years. And that's the same thing now, what Tyson Fury is going through. They're trying to push him out, and, and he's number one. But obviously everyone loves Anthony Joshua and, and what he's doing. He's a good-looking kid. He's world champion. He's knocking everyone out. He's doing a good job, and he's doing a good job. Where Tyson Fury is the complete opposite, isn't he? He just says what's on his mind. And the things he's saying, it's not even like the bad things. It's just actually genuine, genuine things. Like, he really doesn't care, but the things he's saying, most of it's true, what he's saying. It's not like he's lying or fibbing or saying bad things. He's just saying true things, isn't he? The main thing, you know what the worst thing I think it were is with him? Him being a, him being a, a, a traveller. To, to some people, that's like worse than actual being like a, an ethnic. I mean, it is sad. Some people still think like that. And it's, the way it is, it's like, if he was if he was a born British, like, he obviously is born British, but I'm saying if he was British and not a traveller, he would be massive. But because he's not, because he's a traveller, it's like they're trying to section him out a bit. It's a bit, a bit racist, isn't it? Yeah, it is, it is. You know, it is. It's wrong the way they're treating him, to be honest. But, hey, you know, they, they don't really care, you know. And I hope that it doesn't bother him. And I hope that, um, you know, that, that he doesn't retire. I hope you he's think he's, gonna, he's not bothered? No, he ain't going to retire. He's not. He's not bothered. There's no one out there this moment in time for him to cause him any trouble. He would clean. People are forgetting that there's only a year between Anthony Joshua and Tyson Fury. And Tyson Fury's been a pro for so long, he's learned a lot. I, I think it, it'll take another at least two years, or probably more, for, for uh, Anthony Joshua to learn to get to beat someone like a Tyson Fury fighter. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree, I agree. Right, we'll leave that there. We'll, I'll, I'll ask you the last question i got for you, kid. Um, firstly, on, well, two questions. I'll ask them both at the same time. Firstly, who do you want... Who? Because obviously Brooke needs a big fight now because Khan's gone and, and chased Canelo. Who do you yeah. want to see Brooke fight next and who do you reckon's going to win out of Khan and Canelo on the weekend? Um, who would I like to see Brooke fight? Anybody in the welterweight division. I personally believe Kel would be any welterweight out there. Anybody, any, any welterweight you can say, Kel would be... I'd like to see him against any of the world champions, Timothy Bradley, that Vargas kid, Danny Garcia, any in Fairman, Port, any of them. I would put my house on Kel Brook to beat any of them, and in style as well. And as and for the winner between Khan and Canelo? Khan and I can see Khan. I want Khan to win, because it'd be like, it's going to be a big thing in if he wins. And the Kel Brook will be even bigger. But I just can't see him, I can't see him winning. I think he might get stopped after eight. If he if he sticks to his boxing, I think he could survive. But I just can see him getting dragged into something. You know what I mean? And and, and Alvarez is a world class fighter, man. He's one of the best fighters they've got out there in a minute. And he's a superstar. And a bit, a bit, it's a hard it's a hard ask for for Khan to do what he's got to do to be someone like him. Yeah. Anything's possible in this game. One shot can change the whole thing. I mean, what, yeah. How do you think that fight's gonna get on? Um, I said it earlier on the show. How do you think um, that fight's going to get on? I think that I think that Khan will will win the you know the first few rounds as he always does. I can't see the whole fight going oh. to the distance without a knockdown because he just gets too involved. He, he can't he can't stop. He's always got to trade off with them and stay in the pocket. He just has to do it. I don't. I think I just don't think he, he's he's one of the fighters where he can stand there and not really get hit. He has to move not to get hit. You know, like a middle of the kind of fighter. He can be there, but he's not there to get hit. Where Khan, yeah. he's either the only way he can avoid shots is by moving. And if he just can't move, if he's standing still, he's gonna get hit. And can he, can he, can he stand up to to a puncher? Obviously, Alvarez is a much bigger guy, and he's fast and he falls. He doesn't fall single, he just falls twos and threes. He can't just. It's a big ask for him. But in the then the day, but it's boxing it and one shot can always change everything. Yeah, so it doesn't matter what happens in the fight with Khan because he's a winner. He's a winner no matter what, isn't he? Wins are, everyone's expecting him to lose anyway. Yeah. Credit to uh, him. Yeah. You can't knock him. He's got he's got some big some big cojones. But yeah, um first and foremost we are we are definitely rooting for Amir Khan and we hope he can do the business. All right, listen, yeah. Kid Galahad, um, thank you very much for coming on the show once again. I wish you all the best for no the rest problem. of this year. 
We'll have you no on problem. the show again. I think what we might have to do every single time there's like a big fight coming up, we might have to just ring you up and get your in, get your take on it. <laughs> you can do that. You know, I always speak the truth, and I definitely am boxing. Um, it was a pleasure being on the show again, and uh, hopefully um, we can speak again very soon. Absolutely, Kid Galahad. Thank you very much. Okay, cheers, pal. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, if you haven't listened to the podcast before, is the preview part where we preview the fights coming up this week. I'm going to start with one fight over in Ukraine that I should mention. Andre Rudenko, 27-2. and two. He faces Mike Molo, who has a record of 21 wins, five losses, and one draw. This is for the vacant WBC International Silver Heavyweight title. So Rudenko trying to go down that WBC route and close in on on a belt with, at the moment, with Wilder. But Wilder's got a tough, tough fight coming up soon against Povetkin. So, yeah, Rodenko, a good fighter, actually. I thought he actually beat Lucas Brown. I want to go on record and say that I thought he beat Lucas Brown when they fought. I think Lucas Brown was very fortunate. And look where Lucas Brown is now. He's got the WBA title around his waist. So we're going to leave that one there. We're now going to go over to Germany. This is a real strange fight. We had Don Charles on a few weeks ago. He's no longer training Derek Chisora, but top of the bill, Derek Chisora faces Kubrat Pulev. Derek Chisora, 25 and 5. Kubrat Pulev, 22 and 1. That one loss coming to Vladimir Klitschko. This is for the vacant EBU European heavyweight title, a belt that Chisora has, of course, held before. What do you think about this fight, Ayaz? It's a strange one. It's a strange one. If Eddie Hearn is being 100% truthful, he offered Chisora the fight for April the 9th, and Chisora didn't want that fight. He decided to take something like a tenth of the money that he was offered to go and fight Kubrat Pulev in Germany, which is a real strange decision. In the end, Joshua ended up fighting for the IBF title, of course, against Charles Martin. What do you think about this fight? Because there's obviously a reason he's decided to choose this one over the big paycheck against Joshua, and he would have been a big underdog against Joshua, just like he's an underdog against Pulev. But it's a little bit closer. What's your take on this fight, Ayers? I reckon this is a very good fight, right? I reckon, from my opinion, who I'm going to pick to, uh, for this fight, I reckon Chizura. And I was watching yesterday at the con- um, I was watching the uh, video of the press conference yesterday when they when Chizura and Pulev went head to head, and I see Chizura grabbing Pulev's head and pushing it down. Yeah, you know, this is this is another thing I'm not too. I'm not too much of a fan of, you know, Derek Chisora seems to do this a lot. We've seen him slap Vitaly Klitschko. We've seen what happened with David Hay. You know, he seems to do this, this type of thing quite a lot. I believe he kissed someone before as well. You know, he seems to do this. It's almost like he, he needs to get some sort of psychological edge going into the fight. I don't know why he does it, but he does it. So you know, it is what it is. I, I'm, I don't know if that's a weakness where he feels like he needs to get one up before the before the first bell. But if he feels he's got that, then then maybe we'll see a good performance from him. To be totally honest, when he done it against Vitaly Klitschko, I don't know if it made a difference, but he, he gave Vitaly Klitschko a good fight for 12 rounds. So when he seems to do this, it seems to G him up a little bit. So I got no problem with that. But you know, they're not nice tactics. It's not good for the sport of boxing, you know, when people are putting hands on each other before the first bell. So we'll have to see what he brings to the table. But in my opinion, I, as I'm going to disagree with you, I think that Pulev will actually stop Derek Chisora. That's my opinion. I'll be, I wouldn't be too surprised if it did go to points, but I think that Pulev will probably stop him. So I'm going to go with a Pulev win. You're going to go with a Chisora win. I think what we should start doing now, every week, we should start picking a winner. You know, I know that we don't like to predict too much on this show, but every week we should start picking a winner of just one or two fights. We should keep a little chart of who's in, like who's in, in you know, who's gonna, who's winning and who's first, who's second. Um, there's going to be some fights that we're both going to agree on. And we should, if we both agree on it, for example, Canelo's fighting Khan. If we both go with Khan winning, if we both go with Khan winning, and one of us thinks it's knockout, one of us thinks it's points, then we can score that. But if we're both going with calm points, then we won't score that, obviously. So I think that's something that we should perhaps do for a bit of excitement on the show. But anyway, we'll talk about that a little bit later. I'm going with Pulev win, definitely. Also on that bill, Vincent Feigenbutz, 21-2. and two. He faces Chris Pulo, Javier Andino. 
who has a record of 19 wins, nine losses and one draw. I think this is just a fight for Vincent Feigenbutz to get back in the picture, really. So just thought I'd mention that anyway. Going over now to Manchester, formerly the MEN. I think it's the phones for you, Arena. I'm not sure what it's called right now. Top of the bill, Anthony Crawler, Anthony Million Dollar Crawler. He defends his WBA World Lightweight title against arguably the riskiest fight in the division, to be totally honest, against Ishmael Barroso. We've seen Barroso take Kevin Mitchell apart and ultimately Kevin Mitchell retired after the fight. Anthony Crawler, 30 wins, four losses and three draws. Ishmael Barroso, 19 and 0 with two draws. What do you think about this fight, Ayaz? Very, very brave of Crawler for going in there against Barroso. We have to give him credit for that. We have to give him credit for taking that fight and not being afraid of his power or anything like that and having, you know, having the the cojones to take him on. So what, what, what's your take on this fight? What do you think we're going to see? In my opinion, yeah. I'll tell you one thing. Obviously, we know Ishmael Barroso is a very dangerous fight. He took out Kevin Mitchell in his last fight. Right, this is a very dangerous fight for Crawler. A lot of people are giving Crawler uh, to be the underdog in this fight. But in my opinion, I rec- I'm, I'm giving huge credit for Crawler. And I reckon, personally, I reckon Crawler will beat him this Saturday. Come danger zone. Do you think it will be inside the distance or do you think it will be on points? I reckon, in my opinion, it will go to points. Yeah, yeah. It's a tough one to call. Ishmael Barroso, a real banger. Of his 19 wins, 18 of them have been by knockout. So he can really, really bang. It's a risky fight. It really is a risky fight. It's a tough one. And yeah, we do have to give credit to Ishmael Barroso. Uh, sorry, to, to Anthony Crawler for taking this fight. He's also a southpaw as well, you know. So it's a tough, 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 tough cookie to work out this one. But credit to Crawler. And I really hope he can do it, of course, in front of his... He's, he's all his fans down at Manchester Arena. He's been for a lot of stuff in his personal life, Crawler, and he's a absolute credit to the to the sport of boxing here in Britain, definitely. Also on that bill, Shane Singleton. He fights for the vacant WBC International Silver Welterweight title. He faces Adil Amwar. Shane Singleton, twenty two and one. Adil Amwar, twenty two and five. Also on the bill, Paul Smith. He faces Daniel Reggie. This is at super middle, this one. It's only scheduled for eight rounds. Paul Smith has a record of 35 wins and six losses. Daniel Reggie, 28 wins, 13 losses. So this is really a routine fight. I think Paul Smith's just going to, you know, use this fight as a bit of a springboard to get back on that world level, or should I say, get back in those in those big fights. You know, a lot of people argue that he's not world level. I think he showed his class, to be totally honest, against Arthur Abraham in both the fights. So I think he is thereabouts. He is up there. He is thereabouts world level. So all credit to Paul Smith, and I want to see him back And I want to see him hopefully get in there and try and win some version of the title. I definitely fancy him over over Felix Sturm, as I've said before. And I think, I'm not sure what's going on with Felix Sturm. It all come out that he had tested positive for some sort of illegal substance. I don't know what's the latest on that, but we'll leave that there. Marcus Morrison also on the bill. He looks to move to 11-0. Martin Murray's also on the bill. He looks to pick up his 33rd professional win. He faces a guy called Cedric Spurrer, who has a record of 12 wins and four losses. Of course, Martin Murray, he'll be fighting George Groves on the Joshua undercard. So this is really just a keep busy fight for him. I know that he wants to get out there and have another fight beforehand. So this is his fight. Also on that bill, Tommy Coyle, he fights again. He looks to move to 22 and three. He faces Ronaldo Mora, who has a record of seven wins, 12 losses and one draw. So it's a Poor opponent, but it's someone that he's going to probably look good against and get another big fight. John O'Carroll also on the bill. He looks to move to 10 and 0. Jose Burton also on the bill. He looks to move to 16 and 0. That is the cousin of Tyson Fury and a really good fighter, Jose Burton. Underrated in my opinion. Okay, that's it for the UK. We're now going to go over to the USA. We're going to go over to the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, this is a real big stacked card. And this is the last card we're going to mention on the preview part of the show. We're going to start bottom of the bill. Jason Quigley, his record at the moment, 10-0. and 0. He's in a 10-rounder against James De La Rosa, who has a record of 23-3. and 3. This will be a good fight. I hope that Jason Quigley can get past him and move to 11-0. and 0. Jason Quigley, a good fighter. A really good fighter, to be totally honest. Also on the bill, cousin of Oscar De La Hoya, it's Diego De La Hoya. 
Montoya. He at the moment has a record of 14 wins and zero losses. He faces a guy who has 13 wins and zero losses, a guy called Rocco Santamoro. This is for Diego De La Hoya's WBC Youth World Super Bantamweight title. I'm not sure how much credibility that title holds, but it's one that Diego De La Hoya won a few fights ago, so he's defending that, and he's a real good fighter. He really is. I believe he can definitely live up to that De La Hoya name in the near future. Also on the bill, David Lemieux, former world champion. We've seen him loss most recently to Golovkin. He got absolutely battered, to be honest, but he's a good fighter and he can really bang. He faces Glenn Tapia. So Lemieux has a record of 34 wins and three losses. Glenn Tapia, 23 wins and two losses. I'm sure that'll be a real bang up that fight. Glenn Tapia can hit hard as well. So this is only a 10 rounder. It's in the middleweight division, of course. Also on the bill, Frankie Gomez, 20 and 0. He faces Mauricio Herrera. Mauricio Herrera, 22 and 5. This will be a good fight, I'm telling you. Frankie Gomez looking really good as of late, of course, with the 20 wins. But Mauricio Herrera, we've seen what he can do. When he shows up, boy, can he fight. And boy, can he make it look ugly. He's a really good fighter, Herrera, and definitely underrated. A lot of people think he should definitely be a world champion. So this will be an interesting clash. And also, top of the bill, top of the bill, here we are, the big one, Saul Canelo Alvarez, 46 and 1 with the one draw faces Amir Khan, 31 and 3. A lot of people will say, oh, Amir Khan's got the experience. We, we, we need to remember that Sal Alvarez turned professional when he was 15 years old. This is his 49th professional fight. This is Amir Khan's 34th. Of course, Amir Khan has been in multiple world title fights. Saul Alvarez or Canelo, he's building his, his, his legacy, really. He's, he kind of had a lot of fights over in Mexico. He's, he's been on the world stage for a few years now, and he looks very, very solid. His one loss, of course, coming to Freud Mayweather. This is, of course, a catch weight of 155. It's a bit strange. I'm not really in agreement with that, but it's for the WBC world middleweight title. Ayers, talk to me about this fight. I cannot wait for this fight. I'm telling you for a fight. This is going to be the big fight. It's for the, obviously, WBC middleweight title, right? Canelo, who everyone arguably agrees that he's a pound-for-pound pound boxer at the moment, and Khan, who's jumping up two weight classes from welterweight to middleweight to fight Canelo. Khan in this fight is going in as an underdog, right? and Canelo is a big favourite. A lot of people are saying, why is Khan taking this fight? I'll tell you one thing. First of all, Khan's getting a big paycheck from Canelo, right? Second of all, right here, yeah, if he beats Canelo, he's regarded as like one of the, probably the pound-for-pound, pound, and right, if Khan beats Canelo... He's going to be mandatory to face Golovkin in, in his next fight. But the thing is, this fight is known as speed versus power. Speed is coming from uh, Amir Khan and the power is coming from Canelo. If this goes to trading, we're going to see who's going to hit hard. Obviously, we've seen Khan's pictures, like how big he's gone. So, oh my days. I'm, uh, for me, personally, if I'm choosing who I'm going to go for this fight to win, I'm going for Amir Khan points. I'm going to choose the underdog, Amir Khan to win. And I've said it from day since this fight's happened. Yeah, you have. I have to agree with that. Um, yeah, he's sort of jumping up. Well, he's sort of jumping up one weight division and one pound because obviously it's at the 155 limit. Um, but I will say this is this is this shows that Amir Khan's got a lot of balls, which no one questioned. To be totally honest, he's he's definitely in the sport to face the big names. This is undoubtedly, well, arguably, I'll say the biggest fight that could be made outside of Pacquiao or Mayweather. Canelo's probably the most, you know, the biggest profile fighter outside of those two, even though I'm not saying he's the best. I'm not saying he's the best. I'm not saying he's better than Andre Ward or, or Golovkin or any of these guys. I'm just saying he's got the biggest fan base and, you know, people absolutely love him. He's the, he's, you know, he's the hero of Mexico. He's the hero of Guadalajara. So Canelo, it'd be interesting this fight. It really will. I think that Khan will probably start fast I believe he needs to and he'll pick up the rounds uh, I think he maybe will look good for the first two three rounds four rounds I hope he I hope he doesn't do what, he's, what he always does and ends up wanting to trade because if he trades he will get knocked out in my opinion um, 
I really hope he uses his defence and he listens to Virgil Hunter. Virgil Hunter, a very calm voice in the corner, someone who really knows the sport. I think he's absolutely exceptional trainer, to be honest. Very, very underrated. When it comes to the world's best trainer, no one thinks of Virgil Hunter. I think he's done a brilliant job with his fighters. He really has um, Andre Ward, Khan, etc. I think he's done really well. So he's a good voice in the corner. As long as Amir Khan tries to keep it long. Amir Khan's got a good reach, by the way, and he's got a good jab when he uses it, and he can box really well when he uses all this stuff. So I hope he uses the tools in the right way, and I really hope he can go out there and beat Canelo. But like I say, I think he's going to start fast. I think he's going to pick up a few of the early rounds. Canelo will probably be a bit frustrated with him because he knows that he's never fought anyone this fast. Amir Khan, the fastest hands in boxing. And if he if he does want to trade off with Canelo, I think Canelo, that's his chance. You know, he's just got to box him. He's got to box and move. And Khan's got good feet and we need to see good feet in this fight. If anyhow he stands in the pocket, he's in so much trouble. And if that happens, he might, you know, he might get dropped. Um, I don't think this fight's going to go to 12 rounds without a knockdown. I'm going to predict there's going to be a knockdown. I don't want to say it's going to be Khan. I don't want to say it's going to be Canelo. I know a lot of people will go, well, if, if someone gets knocked down, it's, it's got to be Khan. I just, I'm just going to say, I think there's going to be a knockdown. I don't know if it's going to be Khan or Canelo, but I've just, I've got this feeling there's going to be a knockdown. I just can't see who it is. Um, I really hope Khan can beat him on points, but if I'm squeezing for a prediction, I've got to go with, I've got to go with Canelo. I don't know, probably by knockout. I've got to go with Canelo. I really hope I'm wrong. I really hope I'm wrong. I really do. You know, I love Amir Khan. I think he's a brilliant fighter. One of the best fighters pound for pound in Britain, definitely at the moment. He's done a lot for us. I think he's he's exceptional. Really, really goes out there and, and flies the British flag high. So all credit to Amir Khan for taking this fight. But yeah, the winner will face Golovkin or they'll have to vacate the belt. I don't know what's going to happen with that. I really hope that we do see the winner face Golovkin, but I hope that they don't have to, you know, drop the title and all that because it would be a good fight. Whoever wins this fight, it will be a good fight against Golovkin. A lot of people can laugh at that and say, well, you know, if Khan beats him, Khan's no way going to gonna beat Golovkin. No way you get knocked out. Oh, my God, he, you know, his glass jaw gets get smashed in. No, we haven't seen Khan fight at this weight yet. It all depends on how good he looks. Imagine if he looks like an absolute powerhouse and just smashes the life out of of Canelo. You, you, we just don't know. We just do not know what we're in store for, you know? So it's going to be so intriguing. Like I say, credit to Box Nation for picking up this fight. This is another brilliant fight that they've brought to us. Box Nation have been on fire, especially in the last few months and in the coming few months. They've been absolutely on the ball, Box Nation. I don't know what a lot of us would do without Box Nation. So all credit to them for picking up this fight. As I said, one of the biggest fights that can be made in the sport of boxing right now. That's really it for the previewing on this week's show we're now going to welcome our second guest okay now it's time for guest number two on this week's show of course fighting in a big fight on the canelo versus khan undercard it's mauricio herrera mauricio welcome back to the show oh thank you for having me here we are again and uh ready to rock and roll saturday big fight ahead of me Absolutely. I just wanted to, the first thing I wanted to ask you, I just wanted to touch on one thing. Of course, you've only had the one fight in 17 months. Of course, that was against Hank Lundy, where you picked up the two bad cuts. Have they fully recovered? And is there any chance of any ring rust on your part come Saturday night? Um, no, you know, the, the cuts are, I think, are healed already and uh, I had more than enough time. Um no, I, I don't think I have rust. You know, when, back when I fought Danny Garcia, I, I had almost a year off and uh, still came back and looked strong and fresh. And I think, um, you know, I've, I felt, uh, I've been training for three months, so so a lot of that is uh, already out the window. And uh, for fresh, and it's a new weight, didn't have to drop too much, so I'm, I'm ready to go. Now, of course, you're fighting against, um, you know, undefeated 20-0 and 0 Frankie Gomez on the Canelo Khan undercard. What do you know about Mr. Gomez, and how happy are you to be on such a huge fight card? Well, uh, Gomez, I know I've been watching him fight, and I got to see a uh, fight up close, front row, and uh, when he fought Vernon Perez, you know, and he reminded me of a little Miguel Cotto. He was a strong, you know, he's a strong fighter. He's a big amateur background, I know that. Um, uh, seems to have a solid punch, good speed, you know, um, in and out movement. Um, you know, he has everything that a young prospect you want to see, that you want to see in a young prospect. So, you know, I'm real excited. I got this opportunity on the big stage, you know, it's Canelo Khan. It's one of the biggest matches they can make. And 
and I'm excited to get in there and have some fun in the ring. And what better than to do it with an undefeated prospect again? I'm not too sure if it's if it's the same over there than it is over here. Over here, um, I know that like in in the in the bookies, it's not really you know it comes down to what happens in the ring. But over here, he's the favorite. Is that the same over in 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 the US? If you know, uh, no, I don't know. Some have uh, told me something like that, but uh, you know, it, to me, it doesn't matter. You know, everybody counts me out, including the judges. So uh, you know, I'm I'm in my own path. I'm. Um, I'm hungrier than ever, as you see every fight I go in there. I'm not discouraged by what they do to me. You know, I, I've been through my struggles in my career. And uh, um, Saturday night, I'm just going to have fun. I'm going to give it my 100%. And I'm uh, guaranteed I should pull the win. You know, I'm, uh, I'm Frankie Gomez uh, brought the best out of me in training. So I um, expect to see a great fight and uh, pull off another great win. Now, of course, for this fight, you're stepping up to 147, welterweight. Is this a weight that you'll be staying at for a while, or is this purely because of the big opportunity that's presented itself? Um, no, you know, I'm, I'm, if, if I feel comfortable and, and, and nice at this weight, I'd um, be happy to stay. You know, I, I made this day at 147, you know, um, been 140 for a while. I mean, I, I can make 140 if they offer me something worth it. You know, I'd probably go back down, but... um. Uh, I think 147 should I, I should feel pretty good in this, in this size. Okay, now I wanted to ask you about the main event. Um, nobody actually this 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 fight actually kind of shocked the boxing world. No one saw this coming. Uh, Canelo against Khan. It was announced, and it just everyone went crazy about it. Of course, you're you're on that undercard. What do you think of that main event, Mauricio? Who do you think is going to win, and how? You know, I was shocked the first two uh, and. Uh, Thought you know it was a mismatch, but the closer the closer it got to it, you know, the closer it came down to it, I started to uh, you know notice Khan and and uh, just just started watching you know uh, their, you know uh, try to go back on their fights, and then uh, I'm giving uh, Khan a good chance in this fight as well. You know, I think it's going to be a a tough fight for Canelo. You know, uh, the more and more I watch him, and then uh, I just uh, I start make the fight starts getting closer to me. So it's really hard to pick. I mean. Uh, one has power, the other has speed and legs. You know, you could dance around the con, that is. So, um, it's very hard to choose, you know. Um, I just hope the best man wins and uh, on with the career. They're both big stars. They'll be stars after this. And uh, it's kind of hard to see. I also want to ask you about a fight that's coming up July 23rd. Um, Postal takes on Crawford. What do you think about that one? That's a huge, huge fight down at 140, of course. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm excited to see that fight. Um, Postol, I think is is uh, is tall, lengthy. I think mean, he'll be Crawford's biggest test, you know. And I, I don't think it would, it's going to be easy night for Crawford, you know. I think uh, if he gets through Postol, you know, then I think he's he's really something you got to worry about. Uh, Crawford, that is. And um, I I think it's it's going to be tough for Crawford, but I think he he may pull it out. But it'll be a close one. Now, the last couple of questions I've got for you now. Another fight that's coming up in the welterweight division, Thurman against Porter. How do you see that one going, Mauricio? Thurman and Porter, another great fight. Uh, uh, look, I, I, I get a lot of this stuff wrong. You know, it's boxing, you know, and I get surprised when it goes on. Uh, I think I like Porter in that fight um, just because he's, uh, he's more cleaner with his punches, more compact. Has a good good style on him, and uh, I think Porter uh, Porter's a little wild, can be a little wide at times. So um, uh, I think I get the little advantage to uh, turn out Thurman on that one. And if Floyd were to come back for one last fight in September, who would you like to see him in there with? Who would give him the you know the, the closest fight out of all the contenders at one four seven? One forty seven, uh, very tough. You know, Khan Khan if he moves back down one forty seven, that'd be a good fight for Floyd Mayweather. Uh, yeah, I think that that's probably the only one I see that uh, that'll make it more uh, a more interesting match. You know, especially seeing what happens tonight. Um, I think somebody out there, or you know, even Canelo again, if if they want to do Canelo and Mayweather be good fight, or the winner winner of this fight should we give with Mayweather? Yeah, definitely. I can't I can't disagree with that. Right. Um. So of course today you did your you did your media workout. What else happens now from from this point onwards? What what what, what do you do for the rest of today, tomorrow, and 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 the last couple of days before fight night? You know, today we just uh, went and uh, got loose at the gym after our media workout. Uh, tomorrow I guess is the we do a little uh, tour to the T-Mobile Arena, check out kind of where we're going to be doing our battle for Saturday. 
um, some couple of interviews, and then I think it uh, will be the press conference. Press conference will go on tomorrow, and uh, we'll get to say what we got to say about each other, try to scare each other, and um, pretty much wait till Friday for the, for the weigh-ins, and um, then Saturday come fight time, we're going to be ready. So for now, it's kind of just relaxing and waiting for the next two days to go by. Okay, Mauricio, is there anything you want to say at all to anybody who could be listening? I just want to tell everybody, hey, look out for me, May 7th. Uh, I got all the experience. I'm ready for the new fans to watch me, so tune in. Taking on Frankie Gomez. You're going to see the maestro, bigger, better, faster, more hungrier. Still trying to reach the top. And I uh, hope that I erase everything that's happened to me in the past. Uh, so thank you guys. Tune in. Absolutely. Listen, Mauricio, it's always a pleasure having you on the show. We wish you the best of luck for Saturday, and no doubt we'll speak to you sometime after the fight. No problem. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the fight, Terry. Will do, Mauricio. Take care, my friend. All right, man. You too. Thanks for the interview. Okay, now it's time to conclude episode 31 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. I as Sumra has been I as Sumra. This has been episode 31. That is 31 episodes in 31 weeks. For the listeners that come back week in, week out, we absolutely commend you. And hey, for the first time listeners who have never listened before, spread the word. Tell your friends. It's all love here at the Box Hard Podcast. If anybody wants to shout out, please do remember you know where to go on Twitter at box hard podcast i want to also say a massive thank you to our two guests on this week's show kid galahad and mauricio herrera we'll be back next week with another big show until then take care